Okay, I've just started the recording. So I am Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. And today is February 15th. We're in the middle of our uh, monthly Forest Connect webinar series. And every month we bring you outstanding presenters and great presentations. This month is no different. We're joined by Suzanne Traeger. Suzanne is with uh, Audubon, New York. She's been working with them for several years and doing lots of things forestry and bird related, which has been an interest of Audubon, New York for quite some time. And they have been working on a guide for foresters. And this is a presentation that will uh, talk about forest management practices for New York birds. And with that, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it over to Suzanne. I will hover here in the background and enjoy the presentation. It's all yours, Suzanne. Thank you for joining us. Great, thank you, Peter, and thanks for everyone who is attending today. Um, as Peter said, I'm Suzanne Traeger. I'm the Forest Program Manager for Audubon New York, and today I'll be talking about a new guide that Peter mentioned um, that Audubon New York has written for foresters and other land managers uh, to use when improving habitat for birds and other wildlife is the goal or one of the goals for managing forests. Um, and although the title says New York birds, um, I know a lot of you are from other states, uh, many of the species and concepts I'll address can be applied to forested landscapes um, elsewhere in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic states too. Let me advance my slide here. Hmm. Here we go. Okay, so for the webinar today, I'll start by providing a bit of background for why we wanted to develop this guide. Um, and then I'll get into an overview of the content covered in the guide, um, including what is quality habitat for a suite of forest birds. Um, I'll go over a landscape scale forest habit, habitat management guide and give examples of civil cultural prescriptions that integrate bird habitat improvements. Um, I'll then discuss a few examples of how Audubon New York is applying some of the recommendations from the guide uh, in our on the ground efforts in different parts of the state. Um, and then I'll open it up to questions. Okay, so to start, Audubon New York's Healthy Forest Initiative, um, which is part of a larger program by the same name implemented by National Audubon Society um, through, throughout the Atlantic Flyway, um, I should start by saying Audubon New York is the state program of National Audubon. Um, so Audubon connects with foresters and forest owners to provide information and assistance to improve forest habitat for birds in need of conservation and to help create healthy forested landscapes that meet other societal needs, um, including carbon sequestration, watershed protection, um, uh, forest products, recreation. Um, Audubon has identified priority forest areas from Maine to Florida composed of large tracts of forest, contiguous forest, uh, that support rich uh, and abundant populations of priority forest bird species. So this map here is showing those forest priority areas along the Atlantic Flyway, the eastern, eastern states in the U.S. Um, so for breeding forest birds, these areas represent Present the most important habitats um, in the U.S. portion of the Atlantic Flyway, and they serve as focus areas for Audubon's Healthy Forest Initiative. Okay, and so this is zooming into New York State and our priority forest areas here. Uh, we have 25 priority forest areas distributed throughout the state. Um, you can see some of the largest uh, forest priority forest areas are the Adirondacks, the Catskills, the Allegheny Forest Tract. Um, and these priority forest areas are also identified as important bird areas. Um, we concentrate our forest habitat conservation efforts within these priority forest areas. And Audubon does this by providing outreach, technical assistance. Um, we also provide habitat management recommendations to foresters and other land managers. 
Um, we provide uh, recommendations and technical assistance to public and private landowners, um, as well as to a lot of our partners um, at various agencies and organizations, again, in a greater effort to improve forest habitat quality for birds. So Audubon New York has identified 50 forest bird species um, considered to be species of regional conservation responsibility in New York. So a significant portion of these species here, their breeding populations use forests within the eastern forest region. Um, and many of these birds are also experiencing population declines or significant threats to their habitat. So why are we seeing population declines of forest birds? Uh, New York State has 63% forest cover. Um, so we have a lot of forest here, um, but the problem is it's not necessarily quality habitat. And there's a number of factors that can influence habitat quality for forest birds. Um, and some of these include forest fragmentation, uh, which can increase the amount of forest edge. And forest edge occurs where there's an abrupt transition from forest cover to a non-forest cover type. So things like agricultural operations or developed areas. And increased forest edge can lead to increased predation of forest nesting species by um, predators like skunks, raccoons, cats. Um, and it also increases nest parasitism by brown-headed cowbirds. Um, and brown-headed cowbirds will actually lay their eggs in the nests of other species who will then raise their nestlings. Um, and the picture here um, is an adult wood thrush sitting on a nest. Um, several of its own nestlings are um, below it on the right hand side. You can see it looks like they're sleeping. Um, uh, but the nestling on the left is a brown headed cowbird nestling, uh, which looks quite a bit larger and uh, much more aggressive uh, to be fed. Um, so some more threats to habitat quality uh, includes things like interfering vegetation, uh, including both native and non-native invasive plants, as well as overabundant deer. Uh, both interfering vegetation and deer, high deer densities can impede forest regeneration uh, and reduce forest understories that some birds require for habitat. Um, also, homogeneous forest structure um, due to lack of natural disturbance or lack of forest management um, can lack structural diversity that many forest birds need. Um, and also high grading um, can leave behind poor forest habitat, habitat conditions. Also, forest pests like emerald ash borer and hemlock woolly adelgid can impact birds by altering forest composition and affecting birds that may have habitat associations with certain tree species. And then with climate change, uh, changes in precipitation, severe weather events, and expanding ranges of forest pests and new invasive species, um, all are stressors on forests and how we apply management strategies to try and improve how resilient these forests may be um, critically important for all wildlife, including people. So we know that the application of sustainable forest management can greatly improve forest bird habitat. So we wanted to create a guide that communicated the habitat needs of forest birds, as well as demonstrated how to integrate forest management, planning, and silviculture with improving habitat, um, while also being able to achieve other management objectives like timber production. Um, it's important to note that the guide provides habitat recommendations that benefit the full suite of forest bird species. So uh, the guide is not focused on single species conservation. Uh, so our recommendations uh, can be broadly applied to benefit a broad suite of species. Uh, the guide contains more technical information, um, and it's geared towards our tar target audience of foresters, land managers, um, and other forest management practitioners. Um, it can be applied to public and private land, um, and it's applicable to small and large acreages. Um, so the guide overall builds on Audubon New York's conservation efforts throughout the state, uh, where we have... Um, been collecting uh, data on how birds respond to forest management. We hold educational and training workshops about forest habitat for landowners, uh, foresters and land managers, and we also provide technical assistance uh, through site visits, habitat assessments, and also writing habitat management plans. 
Okay, so to begin the overview of the content of the guide, uh, we begin by discussing what is quality habitat for a suite of forest birds. And really the bottom line is that forest habitat diversity is key for birds. And we approach that on two fronts, uh, landscape level diversity and also stand level habitat diversity. Okay, so because each bird species has different habitat requirements, healthy and diverse forested landscapes are critical to meet the habitat needs of the entire suite of forest birds. So for example, some birds prefer to nest in mature forests with a relatively closed canopy, while others prefer to nest in young forest habitat that has shrubs and sapling sized trees with high stem density, um, thick foliage cover, a few overstory trees, um, and then there are forest birds that will use both mature and young forest habitats for nesting. Um, so a mixture of forest age classes and forest types on the landscape provides nesting habitat for birds with different needs. Um, and this mixture also provides a diverse array of habitats where birds can raise their young after they fledge the nest. So forested landscapes that are composed of approximately 5 to 10% young forest and we, we have a, a kind of an estimate of uh, the, the uh, age and years for the young forest age class, zero to 10, but it kind of depends on where you are in the state, um, somewhere around zero to 15 years. Sometimes uh, in the North Country, it could be zero to 20 years, upwards of 20 years, um, to uh, be in, still categorized as the young forest age class. Um, and also mature forest age class, which we've categorized here as greater than 50 years in age. Uh, can provide a suitable mix of habitat for a suite of forest birds. And for this guide, we've included the intermediate age class, which is somewhere around 15 to 50 years with the mature forest category. And we mostly did this because during this period, um, fewer young forest birds and more mature forest birds are using this habitat. So it just kind of made sense to combine it with the mature age class category. So given, you know, long term, term rotations, 100 to 200 year rotations, with 5 to 10 percent in a young forest age class, uh, multiple age classes would be present throughout the forest, uh, which would maintain a high degree of horizontal structural diversity. Um, and I want to point out here that we are including in the young forest uh, uh, habitat category uh, things like regenerating forests, so seedlings and saplings. We're also including shrublands. Um, shrubland swamps, and also old fields with woody encroachment. So, and again, forest age class diversity within a forested landscape is important because some birds, like the prairie warbler and eastern towhee pictured here, require young forest habitat for nesting, uh, while species like the uh, scarlet tanager and wood thrushes pictured here require mature forest for nesting. And then there are birds uh, like evening grosbeaks in northern Perulas pictured here that will utilize multiple age classes for nesting. So they will use both mature and young forest age classes. Um, young forest habitat is needed for species that use it exclusively for nesting, but it's also critically important habitat for many species that nest in mature forest is they will frequently move their fledged young to areas with a dense forest understory or to young forest habitat. So young forest habitat provides fledglings with ample cover and dense vegetation. Um, it also provides abundant foraging opportunities uh, of insects and fruits. So as I mentioned earlier, the guide includes information about stand level habitat components important to forest birds. Um, the conditions apply to mature forest stands, uh, but also some of these can, per, uh, can pertain to young forest stands as well. The stand level habitat features covered in this section are limited to what a forester can influence through management. So it is not necessarily um, comprehensive in detailing all important habitat components such as streams and other water bodies. Um, but through appropriate management, foresters can enhance stand level habitat features to increase forest birds nesting success and rearing of fledglings. 
um, habitat features and management goals to achieve those features can be integrated into civil cultural prescriptions when developing management plans intended to improve habitat. So to begin some of these stand level habitat features, we'll start with vertical structural diversity, uh, which is the layering of vegetation um, at multiple heights in a stand. Um, stands with high vertical structural diversity have an overstory, midstory, and understory vegetation layers uh, that tend to have a combination of trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants, um, and vines. Um, and vertical structural diversity is so important because it provides different birds with places to nest, perch, um, forage, seek cover, raise young. Uh, structural complexity can be enhanced in mature forest by creating canopy gaps to stimulate the growth of understory vegetation. And in general, creating or maintaining vertical structural diversity within a mature forest stand is highly beneficial to many forest breeding birds. Um, native vegetation provides the most habitat value to wildlife. Um, so managing forests to provide a diversity of native trees, shrubs, vines, herbaceous plants increases the suitable habitat potential for forest birds. Um, although some native species, such as American beech um, and some ferns, can dominate a stand and reduce diversity, um, but native plants support all or part of the life cycles of our native insects, which are the primary food source for the majority of forest bird species during the breeding season. And in addition, native trees and shrubs produce more nutritious mast, so uh, fruit, seeds, and nuts, when compared to non-native plant species. Um, where interfering vegetation is prohibiting the growth of native trees and shrub species, um, apply control methods to the interfering vegetation to release the native species, um, increase species diversity of native trees and shrubs by applying civil culture that allows varying amounts of sunlight throughout the area you are managing, and this will promote growth of species of varying shade tolerances, uh, which will overall increase your species diversity. So managing for a diversity of native forest plants will ensure that birds have available food sources, including insects and mast, and having different species will increase the chances of having some mass production um, from one year to the next. Okay, large diameter trees. Uh, so hardwood trees of at least 24 inches um, diameter at breast height, or DBH, um, and softwood species of at least 20 inches DBH offer nest sites, perches, and places to forage for a number of forest birds, uh, including red shoulder hawks and broadwing hawks. And large trees with cavities and large dead branches enhance the habitat for many forest birds. Um, I'll talk about cavity trees in a minute, but if you can leave large diameter cavity trees, um, that, is, that certainly is a bonus. So our recommendation is where possible, retain a component of large diameter trees. If none are present in the stand you're managing, um, you can select some smaller ones to leave and become large diameter wildlife trees in the future. Conifers provide birds with uh, cover habitat, um, also places to nest and forage. Um, softwood inclusions are specifically sought out by some forest birds for breeding habitat, um, such as uh, blue-headed vireos and um, black-throated green warblers. So our recommendation is where you are able to retain or promote at least some softwoods where they occur, and especially within predominantly hardwood stands. Um, and even a small cluster of softwoods uh, has high habitat value to forest birds. Um, dead standing trees, um, or snags, provide locations for nesting, roosting, foraging for insects, um, and cavity trees of all sizes provide nesting and roosting sites for birds. And both snags and cavity trees are heavily used by other wildlife as well. Um, keeping a range of size classes of snags and cavity trees, um, and cavity trees can be living or dead, um, is desirable, but a general rule of thumb is the larger, the better. So for snags, 
hardwood species of saw timber or large saw timber size will provide the best long-term habitat value as dead standing wood. And then eventually as coarse down woody material when they fall. Um, so our recommendation is where you can do so safely, try to retain at least six snags or cavity trees per acre, uh, with one ideally being at least 18 inches uh, diameter breast height and three at least 12 inches DBH. Um, if this min minimum can't be met, you can identify and retain small trees that may become larger snags or cavity trees in the future. And in clear cuts or sea tree sites, uh, keep some cavity trees and snags um, as your reserve trees. Um, and I know some of you may be thinking, whoa, six snags or cavity trees per acre is a lot. Um, but keep in mind, these are targets. You may be able to come close to this target in some parts of a stand, but not others. And it really does depend on what your management objectives are. Um, downed woody material, or DWM, includes both coarse woody material, um, and we have it here as being greater than three feet in length and greater than 10 inches in diameter. Um, it also includes fine woody material, so things less than three inches in diameter. Um, downed woody material enhances habitat for forest birds by providing places to seek cover, perch, um, nest, and forage. Larger downed logs, so greater than 18 inches in diameter, provide a specially important habitat structure for birds and other wildlife that forage or nest on or near the forest floor. And those larger logs are also used for dr drumming displays by ruffed grouse. Um, an added benefit in areas where deer densities are excessively high, um, leaving slash behind may prevent deer browse and benefit forest regeneration uh, because it provides an obstacle uh, that prevents deer from reaching seedlings and saplings. Um, so our recommendation is where you can protect existing downwoody material during harvest operations and increase downwoody material by leaving poor quality logs and cull material um, or treetops and other slash and providing coarse woody material of different size classes and stages of decay is ideal. Okay, so this is a snippet of a table from the guide, um, table one specifically, um, and the full table in the guide um, shows all 50 of Audubon New York's um, priority forest birds. Um, it also shows their preferred nesting habitat, uh, the post-fledging habitat that they use, and also, it gives um, the stand level habitat features that I just covered um, that each species is associated with. So, the information included in this table may be useful when writing uh, prescriptions, pr excuse me, prescriptions for management plans that need to address additional multiple resource concerns um, in addition to timber management. Uh, but it also may be helpful if you are working with a forest owner that is interested in managing their woodlot for particular species. Okay, so the next section in the guide is the Landscape Scale Forest Habitat Management Guide. It's a really long name for this section. Um, so this landscape guide uh, can be used to determine forest habitat that may be absent from the landscape. Um, and also how the parcel you're managing can be managed to provide the needed habitat. Um, it can be applied to smaller acreages, so don't let the, the landscape uh, title um, throw you off. It can also help determine what kind of forest management to use to enhance habitat for forest birds and in what circumstances to use it. So depending on the surrounding landscape, even-aged or uneven-aged silviculture or a combination of the two can be implemented to achieve um, timber, habitat, and other management goals. And for scale, a landscape can be considered to be about 2,500 acres inside, in, I'm sorry, in size. Okay, so the landscape guide provides instructions on how to determine the percent forest cover within a 2,500 acre landscape using satellite imagery, um, <clears throat> being careful to exclude non-forested areas. So developed and agricultural areas um, are obviously excluded from this assessment, 
Um, so the total amount of forest acres, um, including mature and young forest age classes, is divided by 2,500. And then an acreage estimate of young forest occurring in the landscape is divided by the total amount of forest to get a percentage of the young forest age class. So using the total percent forest cover and percent young forest age class in the landscape, for landscapes with at least 70% forest cover, uh, our recommendation is to look for opportunities to diversify forest age classes within the landscape so that 5 to 10% of the area is in a young forest condition uh, and the majority is in a, mature, in a mature forest age class. Um, if the amount of young forest does not meet the 5 to 10% goal, we provide recommendations for creating young forest, and um, I'm going to discuss that uh, more in a little bit. Uh, within the mature forest, uh, we recommend to utilize management that will improve uh, those stand level habitat features that I went over. Um, and for landscapes that are less than 70% forested, uh, management decisions will largely depend on what is in the surrounding landscape, um, the level of forest fragmentation, and also the size of the parcel you are managing. And this is because as forest cover decreases at the landscape level, the minimum habitat size needed by birds that nest within the interior of mature forest increases. So this makes the size of the parcel you are managing, as well as any adjacent forest, very important. And this is due to increased edge effects, which I touched on earlier in the presentation, but basically forest edge occurs when there is an abrupt change from forest to non-forest. And edge effects such as predation from um, cats and skunks and raccoons and nest parasitism from brown-headed cowbirds uh, pose a risk to the survival and the reproductive success of forest interior breeding birds. So where the landscape is less than 70% forested and forest cover is fragmented by other cover types such as agriculture uh, or development, um, our recommendation is to keep large contiguous tracts of mature uh, forest intact uh, for birds like scarlet tanagers and wood thrushes that are area sensitive, uh, meaning that they require large habitat patches to successfully establish breeding territories, uh, to nest and to raise their young successfully. Um, area sensitive forest birds need a minimum of about 200 acres of contiguous forest for quality breeding habitat. So the recommendation here is to try and meet that minimum to benefit these birds. And edge effects can be further mitigated by allowing for a buffer of at least 300 feet from the forest edge to where any even age cuts will take place and also softening any hard forest edges where they occur. So if forest fragmentation is very high in the area you are working, so for example, landscapes that may be less than 40% forested, but the parcel you are managing is large, so again, at least 200 acres, um, keep in mind that this may be much needed forest habitat in an area that is lacking forest cover. So our recommendation is to focus on retaining mature forest and applying civil culture practices and systems that will improve vertical structural diversity without compromising species diversity. Uh, and, you know, exercise caution in recommending um, patch cuts or other even age civil culture as edge effects are more likely in a, a highly fragmented landscape. But even, but if uh, even age management is needed, you can minimize potential edge effects by in increasing the amount of forest buffer between harvests and the forest edge. So possibly consider allowing more than a uh, 300 foot buffer uh, and also softening forest edges. Okay, so for landscapes that have less than 5% young forest cover, our recommendations are that harvests that create young forest 
should be at least five acres in size. And this is to accommodate the smallest breeding bird territories for young forest nesting species, um, things like chestnut-sided warblers. And where possible, leave reserve trees. Um, and these can be individual reserve trees, um, or better yet, uh, clustered reserve trees, uh, to enhance structure um, and also provide places to perch for the birds. And um, as far as where to create young forest, uh, look for areas that may benefit from such management to improve forest health and regeneration. Um, so this could include stands with a higher proportion of unacceptable growing stock or UGS. Um, remember to reduce potential, potential predation of young forest breeding birds um, and try not to create young forest near forest edges. So again, try to keep in mind that 300 foot uh, buffer from the forest edge. And this is especially relevant in areas that border more developed areas, again, so urban or suburban areas um, or agricultural areas. Um, when creating multiple areas of young forest within mature forest, um, for example, if you're going to be creating um, several patch cuts, uh, they can be placed in close proximity to one another. So we have down here a recommendation of 0.3 to 0.6 miles apart. Um, and this helps with habitat connectivity for young, spores, young forest species. Um, so if they're already using one patch, uh, they can find the next patch pretty easily. Okay, so what if you have more than 10% young forest in a forested landscape? Um, so our recommendation here is to retain and enhance mature forest habitat uh, by applying management such as um, single tree or group selection harvests, um, you know, things that will help create complex vertical structure um, over multiple entries and over time, um, and then allowing for the young forest to mature to bring the landscape um, into a more desired balance of age classes. Um, but there are some exceptions. Uh, in a few relatively small areas of New York, it may be appropriate for young forests to exceed 10% um, of the forest in the landscape. Um, and the uh, bird here is the golden winged warbler. Um, Audubon New York works with public and private landowners to create young forest uh, within focus areas for the golden winged warbler, uh, which is a high priority species that nests in young forest habitat. Um, the largest golden winged warbler focus area in New York is located in the St. Lawrence Valley in northern New York. Um, so within golden winged warbler focus areas, uh, the recommendation is uh, that young forest, the young forest age class, should make up about 20% of the forest. Um, and this is in order to increase the species population size. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about our work with golden winged warbler habitat later in the presentation. Okay, um, so this brings us to the final section of the guide, which provides several examples of forest stands, landscape conditions, and potential silvicultural prescriptions that could be applied uh, that incorporate habitat recommendations for forest birds. Um, I would like to note that the stand descriptions are very general um, and that most likely there are several plausible civil cultural prescriptions for each stand description we provide that can create the desired habitat uh, while improving timber quality and also meeting other landowner objectives. Um, but we created this section to provide examples of, of how to go about incorporating habitat considerations in forest management planning. Um, and so example prescriptions you know, should be interpreted with flexibility. Um, obviously, there is much to consider beyond what we cover, uh, you know, like site-specific conditions, uh, such as soil type, uh, and obviously landowner objectives. So we'll start with our example stand one. Um, again, very general stand description. Uh, example stand one falls within an intermediate age class of about 30 to 50 years. Um, it's fully stocked composed of mixed hardwoods with high beach density um, and contains over 50% unacceptable growing stock. Uh, there's little to no understory present. 
Um, I feel like I have come across this, this uh, forest quite a bit when I'm out and about. Um, so here we give an, a, an ex initial example, forested landscape context, where the young forest age class goal is met. There is 5 to 10% young forest already present, present within this landscape. So because there is an adequate amount of young forest in the landscape from a bird habitat perspective, and I want to point out that we start each proposed uh, civil cultural prescription with a bird habitat objective. Uh, and this is to better frame each example from a, a habitat uh, need perspective. We propose that variable retention thinning will improve habitat by creating small canopy openings that will promote understory regeneration, which is currently lacking in the stand. Um, so although very minimal at the onset uh, and after multiple entries, thinning will help create subcanopy layers and increase understory structure where it is currently lacking, um, while at the same time maintaining a relatively closed canopy. So a relatively closed canopy would be uh, greater 70% uh, or greater. Um, so accept acceptable growing stock can be retained, um, and harvest can focus on areas of porous quality stock or adjacent to the acceptable growing stock. So this is using similar aspects of a, a crop tree release. And of course, American beech may need some control treatment applied to promote the regeneration of other species. Um, overall, helping to increase stand diversity. Okay, but we also provide a second example for stand one, where the landscape goal of five to 10% young forest is not met. And so we propose a different prescription. Uh, because there is a need for more young forest in this landscape from a bird habitat perspective, um, even aged forest management can be applied to the stand in support of the goal for up to 10% young forest conditions in the forested landscape. So we propose a clear cut with reserves as the prescription. Um, and for the reserves, uh, we suggest um, a residual basal area of 10 square feet per acre. Um, and this is equivalent to about 10 to 15 percent canopy uh, cover left. Um, so the clear cut may be a viable option to create the young forest habitat that's needed and also to regenerate desirable species, um, including some shade and tolerant species. Depending on the size of the stand and timber management goals, um, there may be an opportunity to create several clear cuts across the stand or patch cuts. Um, although again, opening should be at least five acres in size to accommodate um, area sensitive young forest bird species like prairie warblers and indigo buntings that need that larger acreage of young forest habitat for breeding. Um, again, avoid creating hard and straight edges and instead aim for a more um, uh, natural disturbance look with rounded boundaries, um, uh, feather the edges, and of course, control of beach will almost certainly need to occur either before uh, or after the harvest. Uh, we suggest that um, the reserve trees can be arranged in patches, approximately a quarter of an acre in size. And these can be located about every 10 acres or so uh, within the clear cut. Um, within these reserve patches, you can um, retain uh, desirable seed trees, um, but you can also retain um, things like cavity trees, um, some snags, softwood inclusions if they're present. Um, these reserve trees are really important because they also serve as perch trees um, for birds, which is an important habitat feature um, for many young forest birds. Um, and the regeneration of intolerant soft mass producing species um, is likely and species like um, cherries and rubus species um, are really beneficial to birds and other wildlife. So all of this information is really dependent upon your management goals um, and the prescription. 
but this section is really meant to give you an idea of how habitat improvements for forest birds um, can be incorporated into your forest management planning efforts. Okay. So the overview of the guide is complete, and I'd like to quickly discuss a few examples of how Audubon New York is applying um, our forest management recommendations to improve bird habitat throughout the state. And the first example is the Rhinestrom Hill Audubon Sanctuary and Center, which is located in Columbia County. Um, it's a little over a thousand acres in size. It's mostly forested, and most of that forest is mature, and it's all the same age. So there's very little diversity happening on this forested property. So we've decided to use this, this property as a forest demonstration site by creating young forest habitat through clear cuts and also um, low density shelter woods in several stands on the property. The challenge with young forest habitat here is that deer densities are very, very high. Um, with the first clear cut, we installed deer fence uh, around it, um, which you can um, hopefully make out the deer fence in the top uh, photo. Um, and you can see the green regeneration on the inside of the fence uh, compared to the outside. And this photo was taken just a couple of months into the growing season. Uh, the cut was done that previous winter. Um, the bottom photo is from the second growing season. Uh, and obviously we're seeing some really successful regeneration within the fence. So um, where we are creating young forest habitat, we are conducting breeding bird surveys. Uh, we are also conducting vegetation surveys and deer browse impact surveys. Uh, and we've done this pre and post treatment. Um, and also with, within our harvest sites and also outside of our harvest sites. Um, to measure uh, bird and vegetation response. Uh, we also have a dedicated group of hunters uh, that use DMAP permits, um, but time will tell if DMAP is enough to effectively reduce deer densities to a more sustainable level. Um, we have um, a few years of data so far, so it's a, it's a long-term effort um, to see how successful we are here. Uh, for any other future young forest harvest that we do, um, we will be uh, installing deer funds. Okay, and as I mentioned before, Audubon is involved with habitat conservation efforts for golden wing warblers. Um, and this mostly takes place, again, within the largest uh, focus area in the state, which is located in the St. Lawrence Valley. So golden winged warblers um, need young forest habitat for nesting, and they need this young forest habitat within a mostly forested landscape. Um, they have been found to move to nearby areas of more mature forest, as well as other age classes uh, beyond the young forest age class um, during the post-fledging period. Um, so we have staff that have been working with private landowners um, and also foresters to create young forest habitat that's really specific to the golden wing warbler's um, need. So not only do they need young forest habitat, but they kind of need this um, pattern of uh, clumping of shrubs uh, with a, um, a small tree um, located within it. So they're, they're pretty specific in their, their habitat demands. <laughs> um, so we've been working with private landowners, foresters to create this really specific young forest habitat within the focus area. Um, and this also includes public land too. We've been working with some state uh, foresters on some uh, state forest lands. So we provide a lot of outreach in the form of workshops and training sessions for foresters and other practitioners um, to be able to provide uh, habitat recommendations that improve forested habitat for golden wing warbler. And we also provide workshops for forest owners in the area so that they um, can also learn how to improve habitat on their property for golden wing warblers. Okay, that about does it for me. I just wanted to acknowledge the technical review committee members uh, for the guide and extend my, my, my thank you and my gratitude. 
Um, I also want to acknowledge supporters of Audubon New York's work. And the, here is my contact information. Um, the guide will be printed soon. And if you are interested in receiving a copy of it, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, you can also reach out to Peter Smallage too, um, and he can pass along your contact information to me. And um, thank you so much for your time. And I'd be happy to um, answer any questions that you may have. Great, Suzanne, thank you very much. So yeah. I think what we can do is when the guide is ready, if you let me know, I can send an email to everybody who registered for the webinar and give them whatever information you provide in terms of obtaining a copy of that guide. Um, you know, Thanks. obviously if they want to contact you, they can contact you directly, but um, we'll just to make sure that, because everybody that participated in the webinar is probably interested in the guide, so we'll just make sure that we kind of do a batch distribution of that. Great. Um, so there, the chat window has been busy already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me. I don't know if you can. Can you see the chat window on your screen? Um. Or I can. I, I can can't. Scroll. Okay. Uh, let me see That's, if I can pull it up. So, or, or I can go through and I can read questions if. Sure. Yeah, I don't think I can. Some sometimes when the see. presenter is sharing their screen, it's not easy for them to find the chat window. So there's probably a way to do it, but I haven't spent enough time with Zoom software to figure out how to talk you through that. So there are some comments about how the the, the uh, recommendations that you're advancing are similar or dissimilar to ecosystem management. Do you want to? comment on that to ecosystem management yes I think I would need more information about what specifically they're referring to um, so how do you feel about an ecosystem management approach for forest sustainability for all species so beyond beyond birds uh, I'm or, not. <laughs> sure. Um, so maybe I'm, just comment uh, I've, in um, whatever context you think about ecosystem management and, and what sure. you're doing. Sure. So um, uh, here's um, a way. Yes. Here's a, let me, uh, right. <laughs> and right. right. So, um, so what's what's great about um, birds is they do serve as uh, indicators of ecosystem integrity. So yeah. what a lot of research has found is that. Um, typically what benefits uh, a number of bird species is beneficial to a number of other taxa. So uh, there's a study that I, colleagues at Audubon New York conducted about 10 years ago um, that looked at um, insect diversity and bird habitat diversity um, within harvest sites in the Adirondacks. Um, and so uh, again, the uh, uh, habitat improvements for birds tended to also reflect positively on, on other species. So uh, uh, mammalian populations uh, and uh, amphibian populations. Um, the guide goes into much more detail than what I presented here today, obviously, um, but we do provide recommendations as to, um, you know, when doing harvest to avoid um, ecologically sensitive areas uh, like known vernal pools. Um, uh, so, so yes, um, I do feel like the recommendations we put forth overall fit in well with an overall um, ecosystem perspective on uh, managing habitat to benefit the, the greatest number of species beyond birds, including birds too. Okay. Um, so. Good, I, perfect answer, I think. Okay. Uh, so Rick, uh, Rick, identified uh, QDMA, the Quality Deer Management Association, that they've been successful in landscape level management. Um, and he's suggesting uh, kind of as a question that Audubon could jumpstart. At first I thought it was a typo, but it's uh, QBMA, Quality Bird Management Association. So, oh. uh, which is, I guess <laughs> what you're doing, you could just, you know, that's, a, that's another label that you could, you could add to it. So, sure. Um, let's see. There's so there's several comments that, that other people can see. Uh, 
Uh, so Carl asks about, um, and I'm not, we may need to get some clarification on this question, but thoughts about the management of shelter woods for habitat suitability for birds. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Shelter woods, um, they're, I don't want to kind of put this blanket statement out there, but I feel shelter wood harvests have been found to benefit um, a lot of bird species, uh, bird species. Uh, so that, that use, um, the interior of mature forest will also use, um, the habitat created from a shelter wood cut, a standard shelter wood. Um, you'll have the birds that will use both, uh, that will nest in mature forest and will nest in young forest. They will use a standard shelter wood, uh, cut the, the habitat created from that. Um, if you do a low density shelter wood, um, you uh, will see some of the young forest um, nesting species. They will actually use the, the, um, the understory created from a low density shelter wood. Um, so there's, uh, you know, shelter woods, there's such a range of residual basal area, um, canopy cover, uh, you know, conditions left behind that, um, you can really kind of adjust them to uh, meet whatever your habitat management goals may be. But shelter woods can be really, really beneficial. And um, one bird species uh, that's declining really rapidly that benefits from the application of shelter woods is the cerulean warbler, um, which isn't located uh, across all of New York State. Um, it's mostly in the southern part of the state um, and has a, a uh, most of its population within the Appalachians, but, um, uh, but yeah, shelter woods are, um, it, it's a great, um, subcultural prescription to use to benefit, um, a lot of forest bird species. Were there other questions? I'm trying to see. Oh, I'm sorry. I, oh. <laughs> I, have a, I have a cough and I turned my microphone off. You didn't oh. hear me. I was talking to myself. So there are lots of questions, yes. So Tom's asking about um, your thoughts on silvopasture management as it relates to bird habitat management. Silvopastures and agroforestry practice where you, it's common in the south where you have relatively low overstory density uh, managing mm -hmm. for forage, forage species. Um, on the ground and how that might relate to bird habitat management. Yeah, so I'll have to admit, I, I, I don't know, I haven't consulted much research about um, how civil pasture ha or silvo pasture has been used um, in conjunction with um, managing for habitat. Um, uh, but I, I, I would think that if it was done so in a sustainable manner that, um, that you could use it while also improving um, habitat for birds. Um, I think uh, most things when done sustainably can have benefits to a number of wildlife. So, um, but, that, but that is something I, I, I will admit I, I, I am not an expert in. Okay. Uh, Amanda asks, if you worked with foresters in developing the guide, um, and how foresters reacted to the information that's been presented. Yes, I did, a number. Um, so uh, there were a number of foresters on my technical review committee, but I also had um, a few other foresters on the side um, work with me as I developed the guide and review it kind of even before the technical review committee <laughs> um, first laid eyes on it. Um, so it it's interesting. So I, I had... Um, academics in forestry review it, um, but I also had practicing uh, foresters review it, um, and I was really happy to hear that um, more final drafts of the guide, that the practicing foresters, uh, the overall feedback was that they, they did find the information useful, um, and that they admitted that they could see ways that they could start to incorporate some of the recommendations um, into their own uh, management plans. So um, 
I'm sure not everyone who, who receives the guide will feel that way, but um, I feel like overall uh, the, the input I received was incorporated um, uh, from foresters. And uh, so I, I, I feel like the, the feedback I've received so far is that it, it, it does contain some useful information. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully I'll hear from more foresters uh, with their opinions too. Okay. Um, so you, maybe you're not the right one to answer this question, but Steve wants to know what uh, New York State DEC, either on the forestry side or wildlife side, what their role has been in the Healthy Forest Initiative. Yeah, so and, we... And, and Young Forest Initiative, it also looks like. Sure. Um, we partner with DEC a lot um, on many of our projects. Um, we collaborate with them on, um, you know, management plans for state-owned properties. Um, so, uh, you know, we often review um, draft unit management plans for state forests. Uh, we also review habitat management plans that are coming out for wildlife management areas that are participating in the Young Forest Initiative. Um, a bit of background on the Young Forest Initiative that DEC is rolling out. Uh, Audubon was a partner early on in the development of uh, a lot of the concepts for the Young Forest Initiative. So again, you, you might have heard me say a lot, the 5 to 10 percent uh, forest age class goal in a forested landscape. Um, and, you know, that that was kind of adapted uh, by the Young Forest Initiative um, to be applied to their own wildlife management areas, uh, the, the forested um, acreages. Uh, within each wildlife management area. So they um, they use it a little bit differently than we do. Um, their definition of young forest is a little different, um, but largely the concept is the same and it's, uh, you know, trying to diversify forest, forest age classes within these predominantly mature forested landscapes to try to benefit uh, the most wildlife species. Um, you know, a lot of their, their target species tend to be um, game species, but uh, the habitat needs of a lot of those game species like American woodcock and ruffed grouse, um, you know, tend to benefit a number of other associated species as well. So, um, so yes, we, we are very active partners with DEC um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, tend to uh, review a lot of management plans that they, they put out. Okay. Uh, Martha wants to know if the guide, how much the guide will cost. Um, for people to purchase, it's free. Um, this is a, a resource that we are um, going to be distributing to, um, you know, people that attend obviously this webinar um, or any workshops that we put on, um, you know, events that we may attend. Uh, it is free, free to anyone who would like one. Okay. Perfect. People like that cost, that price. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ernie says he's going to be interested in, just so you know, trying to uh, apply the recommendations in Western Maryland. So um, Sean wants to know about the cost, how you afforded the, when you did the regeneration cut, how you afforded the deer fence. Oh, that is a great question. <laughs> So we, uh, so yeah, specific to our, um, our Rhinestrom sanctuary, um, yeah, a, a big challenge I didn't discuss is actually trying to afford a logger to come out and do the harvests. So the first stand that we did the clear cut on that I showcased, uh, was done within staff. Uh, we actually had a, a, a forester on staff who, um, uh, was able to borrow some equipment to be able to take down the trees. It was a very small stand. It was a small patch cut, so it was doable. Um, the, the, the next two um, low-density shelter woods that we want to do, um, we, we don't have the capacity to be able to do that within staff. Uh, we have um, applied for EQIP funding. Um, EQIP is a, a, a federal uh, cost share program. Um, so we have applied to Equip Forestry. We are hoping to hear about the status of our application uh, very soon. Um, it's really the only way that we can afford uh, to do the work is to 
uh, receive the cost share assistance to pay a logger to come in because the uh, the cut is going to be uh, very low quality wood. Um, so yeah, that's a great question, and I know that is um, a major issue with a lot of these forest habitat improvement projects. Um, it tends to uh, be costly to the, to the forest owner. Um, so one of the things we try to do when we work with forest owners is uh, talk to them about the EQIP program and help them with enrollment if they're interested and if they're eligible. Um, so uh, we also try to um, advocate at the policy level for additional funding to the EQIP forestry program in New York State so that more people can uh, benefit from that cost share program. The funds are limited. Okay. Uh, Sally is interested in the, I, I think in one of your earlier slides, you were talking about the distribution of age classes and you have like, uh, I don't know, say is five to 15% and young. And then in this kind of a second category, you lump together intermediate and mature stands. And, yeah. and, and so that was like why they were lumped and I'm wondering if it was just for simplicity on the slide, but maybe not. And then also defining mature habitat. See, she's wondering if 50 years old is too young to be considered mature habitat. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's a great question. And that's something that we definitely uh, debated and discussed quite a bit and um, asked a number of people for their expert opinions on, on how best to approach that. So I think it depends on where you are. Um, as far as putting um, uh, a you know number of years for a forest age class, for um, New most of New York State um, and for the northern hardwoods that dominate this state, uh, you know we came to the conclusion that you know maybe about fifty years or more uh, would be um, reasonable uh, for categorizing a mature forest age class. Um, yeah, and, and as I pointed out too, categorizing a young forest age class, uh, from a wildlife habitat perspective, we tend to look at it um, not in terms of years necessarily, so that's why I kind of gave a range. Some parts of the state, it's up to 10 years. Uh, some parts of the state, it could be up to 20 years that you have uh, the structure and the characteristics habitat-wise that we would still consider uh, fo uh, young forest as young forest habitat. Um, so, uh, that was something that was also agreed upon by a number of our forester reviewers and contributors to the, to the guide. So it, it is a range and it really depends on where you are. Um, you know, in parts of the South, uh, Southern U S that could change, uh, dramatically, but for most of the Northern hardwoods in New York state, um, that was kind of the agreed upon age. Um, for as far as um, combining the intermediate forest age class with the mature forest age class, we did do it for simplicity, um, but also because when you look at that intermediate forest forest age class and the structural characteristics that tend to come with it, so that example stand one that I gave, I purposefully used an intermediate forest age class um, because it's it tends to overall be really poor quality habitat structurally for most forest breeding bird species because it's um, kind of a lot of smaller trees that are jam-packed in there with a closed canopy and there's really uh, no vertical structural diversity happening there. Um, so I thought it was a really great example to use um, of how to go about trying to manage a stand like that to improve habitat for birds. But yeah, as, as far as the forest age categories and the numbers we assign to it, um, those can be, again, kind of looked at with some flexibility, depending on where you are and the specific site conditions that you may be up against. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not so much uh, as a hard number that I was trying to put out there. Um, but an approximation and, and an estimate and really trying to, to, to get people to think more about uh, the structure of the forest um, and uh, how diversifying forest, different forest age classes across the landscape um, can really try to meet the needs of a suite of forest bird species. But yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's a tough one. Okay. 
Uh, Eric wants to know about the shape. I, I mean, it's a f fairly involved question, but essentially the shape of the mm -hmm. clear cuts, whether they're um, kind of uniform geometric shapes or if they would uh, or irregularly shaped to mimic natural disturbances and then feather edges. So just kind of the, both the shape of the clear cuts as well as uh, soft versus hard edges. Yeah, that's a great question. So that really depends on um, the person writing the prescription. So uh, if, you're, if you're going to prescribe a clear cut or a patch cut um, to have the most benefit for the young forest nesting species that will use it, um, you want to you want to uh, make the cut a shape um, that maximizes the amount of interior habitat. So uh, we generally recommend to not do kind of long linear um, strip cuts, uh, but to do maybe more uh, more of a square shape or a uh, rounded shape uh, just because you're really maximizing uh, the amount of interior uh, habitat um, in relation to the amount of edge. Um, there have been some studies done that have shown that some of the um, young forest nesting species will uh, nest more in the interior of those patch cuts uh, and avoid uh, nesting closer to uh, where the young forest uh, meets the mature forest edge. Um, so that's kind of our general recommendation for shape. And, and I do think that it, uh, there are recommendations out there, and I, I think I touched on this quickly, is um, anytime you can mimic a natural disturbance um, for creating, even if it's a small canopy gap, or if you're doing a patch cut or a larger clear cut, um, you know, again, having more rounded edges um, uh, tend, tends to be more beneficial to the birds that use that habitat. Um, and we always recommend trying to soften and feather the forest edges because um, not only the birds that will, like I said, will nest in the uh, patch cuts and the cl clear cuts, they avoid those hard edges. Um, but if you are, um, you know, if you're working with a forest block that does have, um, I'm not talking about the interior, even each management that you're implementing, but rather if you're, um, also ha can can soften the forest edge where there's an abrupt transition. Um, that's always a, a recommendation that we put out there. So, yes. Okay. Um, there are a couple of people who are interested in um, how you deal with invasive plants uh, encroaching into areas where you're creating young forest. And this is uh, particularly an issue in well, throughout New York, but this is the questions originating from the lower Hudson Valley. Oh, yeah. Um, so our uh, management recommendation is to where, where they are problematic, uh, where they're inhibiting uh, forest regeneration, where they're stifling uh, species diversity, uh, uh, control them. Uh, we do it on our own properties, and uh, those are the uh, recommendations that we give to um, you know, any property that we're partnering on to manage as well. It's a recommendation we give to private landowners as well is um, control them. Um, how you do it is really uh, up to the person managing it. Um, we, uh, uh, we use chemical control methods. Um, you know, we, we uh, do a lot of research to make sure that we are timing the application of herbicides uh, when it's uh, most effective at controlling the invasive species. Uh, and, um, you know, we use certified applicators uh, to, to do um, the best job possible. Um, but not everyone uh, is, a, is comfortable with using uh, herbicide application. And in, in that case, you know, we will provide recommendations on effective mechanical control methods. Um, many times on our own properties, we do a combination. So uh, wherever we're uh, managing for invasive species, uh, we'll use chemical and mechanical control methods um, to, uh, to control the invasives. And, and uh, you know, like I said, we, we always do vegetation monitoring to make sure that we're seeing um, uh, the regeneration response that, um, that our, you know, we've set as a goal. But... Yeah, we control invasives. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
All right, Donald wants to know if there are any breeding birds uh, that depend on small patch cuts. He says one to two acres within a mature forest. Yes, that's a great question. Um, absolutely. So, um, you know, if you have, I talked about mature um, interior nesting forest birds. Um, if you can go in and do some small group cuts, um, even individual tree selection, I mean, it, it'll, it'll take some time to get uh, the understory regenerating and develop, you know, that, uh, that great vertical structural diversity that a lot of those mature forest breeding birds need. Um, but yeah, smaller, smaller patch cuts within a mature forest um, are really beneficial to the birds that not only need those understory layers for nest building and foraging, but again, that, that post-fledging period is really critical. Um, and uh, so if you have some dense understory available within a mature forested landscape, uh, those birds are going to use it um, during that period too. The, the, um, the young that when they leave the nest, they'll go and seek cover there. Um, they'll go to forage there. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Smaller, smaller one to two acre openings um, are, it can be really beneficial within a mature forested landscape. Okay. Matt wants to, at one point you were mentioning the need to control uh, beech trees and he mm -hmm. wants to know why. Sure. So I'm not sure where Matt is from, but um, in a lot of parts of New York state, we have beech bark disease. Um, and unfortunately, um, what happens when with beech bark disease is you tend to get um, uh, root sucker growth, essentially, um, as a result of beech bark disease, where you'll get, uh, when a mature beech tree is infected, you get tons of smaller beech trees uh, coming up around it. And those can be, um, they're invasive. Uh, you know, even though it's a native, a native species, you get um, just complete uh, beach uh, dominance in the understory and um, nothing else uh, regenerating because it essentially just kind of uh, shades everything out. Um, so in order to promote species diversity, uh, which is really beneficial to birds, um, where you have issues with beach uh, dominating an understory and preventing regeneration of other species, uh, we do support um, controlling beach uh, so that you can improve species diversity and allow for other species to regenerate. And um, so that's, uh, that's why I, I talked about beech in that one example. That tends to be a really um, common occurrence uh, for a lot of landowners and uh, throughout New York State. Okay. There's a kind of a continuum. Earlier we were talking about um, the age classes and the categorization of age classes and the continuation of that question from Dan is um, essentially using, if I'm understanding the question, to use rather than age classes or maybe in addition to age classes, use the mixture of species um, to look at, um, see, see about the relationship with between older stands and bird species abundance and um, consider the abundance, the suite of species. So I don't know if that's the suite of tree species or the suite of bird species, but okay, so take that either direction you want. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's a, no, that's a good way to look at it. Um, there is in the guide, uh, there's a table I, I didn't show it in the, uh, during the webinar, but um, where we get into um, different uh, civil cultural prescriptions and uh, the habitat they create, um, as well as the birds that will uh, use that habitat. So um, uh, I think that might get at kind of what the suggestion is, um, trying to look at uh, which forest age class can be created from certain management and the birds that will then use that subsequent uh, habitat. So um, that's, yeah, that, I mean, there's, that's a great suggestion. And um, certainly lots of different ways to kind of group group these categories and um, you know capture the important habitat information for each one but okay so we just have a couple more questions if you have time Suzanne sure okay um, so Matt wants to know if the specific question is if there's um, 
uh, if springtime timber harvesting has harmful to songbirds or maybe broaden that, are there any seasonal considerations with timber harvesting relative to songbirds? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the, in the guide, we recommend, um, the, you know, the best time of year to cut is um, not during the breeding bird season. So uh, the breeding bird season um, in New York State typically is May through um, uh, the middle of July. Um, what's uh, kind of good about that is it also coincides with the mud season um, in most years, although I feel like precipitation patterns are a bit askew lately with climate change, but typically that's beneficial to birds because a, a lot of um, harvesting operations don't run during the mud season. Um, you know, but we also recommend following uh, uh, water quality BMPs which provide a lot of guidance on, um, you know, how to prevent redding and impacts to negative impacts to water quality with logging operations. But um, yeah, typically we recommend winter harvests. Um, you know, it, it's not just, but that's when you can do so. Um, sometimes that's not always the case because of uh, when you have a logger available. Um, and we were talking about the challenges sometimes with finding a logger um, who is willing to come in and do a harvest, especially for low-grade timber. So um, it's not always possible. So you kind of have to outweigh the, you know, the uh, kind of the short-term losses with the long-term benefits. Um, so, um, but yeah, we, we do put out, put out the general recommendation of, of trying to keep harvesting operations outside of the breeding bird window. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Is the guide going to be available in digital format? Um, yeah, we will be posting a PDF of it on our website. So that's something that I'd be happy to share with, with everyone uh, participating in the webinar too. Okay. Uh, several people saying great job. Um, <laughs> Uh, so here's, uh, Bob says he often does volunteer work in local public forests. Um, he's wondering about strategies to raise awareness with people um, to the fact that they may have or be looking at a, a poorly managed or an unmanaged forest. And he says that this, the strategy to use something like, uh, hi, I'm Bob and your forest is a disaster doesn't work. So, <laughs> so, so perhaps using, um, have improving habitat for birds would be a good strategy to outreach strategy to, uh, enroll more private landowners and, um, being proactive in managing their woodlots to improve mm -hmm. forest health. Yeah. Yep. And then there's a follow-up suggestion that webinars like this one um, would be a good way to raise that awareness. And, and just uh, as pointed out, all of these webinars are archived on the Forest Connect YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com slash Forest Connect, you'll see all of these webinars. Okay. Uh, Alexander, how do you control, what do you recommend for methods to control American Beach? Um, well, I think it, it again, it depends on, um, who's managing the property, but, um, yeah, I, I know there's, you know, obviously chemical control for beach, um, mechanical control. Um, you know, I think it's just important that when you're planning a harvest, um, you know, to go in and, and do the necessary, uh, pre-treatment of beach, um, and continuing, continuing to monitor, um, the site where you apply the control treatment post harvest and, um, you know, apply effective control methods. If you continue to see, um, beach regeneration, um, especially when it impedes other species from regenerating. Um, I know there are some mechanical control methods out there that I think have been proven to be effective. Um, but, uh, I'm, not exactly sure what, what the appropriate uh, mechanical control methods are that have been effective. Um, so I won't weigh, weigh in on that. 
Okay. Uh, there was a, one of the other participants recommended uh, doing a search on the U.S. Forest Service tree search website. Uh, Jeff Kokenderfer with the Forest Service has done a lot of work on beach control. Ralph Nyland has as well. So there's, mm -hmm. there are some resources on the internet that can, can augment those, that recommendation. So, and there are, I'm, there are some questions, specific questions that are being asked, just so you know, um, Suzanne, then other people are answering them. So I'm not, I'm just jumping I over those. <laughs> <laughs> I do were, see that. I see that Steve from uh, Audubon, Vermont has been weighing in here. Oh, good. On uh, chestnut sided warblers, which I did mention will use um, smaller young forest uh, openings. Um, they probably have the smallest uh, breeding territory size. Um, they will use some really small openings. Um, but, uh, you know, our recommendation of a minimum of five acres when creating young forest is to benefit um, a larger number of young forest breeding species, too. But definitely, if you go in and do a small, a small opening, um, like someone had asked, uh, one or two acres within mature forest, um, chestnut-sided warblers uh, will use it. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll nest in a, a really small patch of young forest, uh, which is great. Okay. And then it looks like the final, Robin says, great presentation. They've been using many of these practices successfully in Northeastern PA. So she's looking great. forward to the guy, just a vote of confidence. So that's all I see for questions. And Suzanne, I want to thank you for a great presentation and, and a very thorough response to an awful lot of questions. So um, this was uh, um, very good webinar. Excellent. And Thanks. you may have the new record on participation. We'll have to check the numbers, but we had it at the peak, you were up at about 180 viewers. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. So that's a get a gold star for that one. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, my thanks to Suzanne and thanks to all of the participants. Suzanne will join us here again live tonight at 7 p.m. So if you all want to see the presentation again, you're welcome to. And uh, with that, I'll sign off. And Suzanne, I'll see you tonight about 6.50. Okay, great. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Thank Thanks, you all Peter. very much. Yes, thank you.